I'd like to introduce uh, our first uh, speaker for the day, uh, keynote speaker, Dr. James Kiley, from who is director of the lung division at the National Institute, uh, excuse me, at the National Heart, Lung, Blood, and Institute of the National Institutes of Health. He's been an instrumental role in helping all lung diseases, but in particular, over the past uh, 10 years, he's been a vital member of the community uh, and supporting initiatives such as uh, understanding pulmonary fibrosis, whether it be through the basic uh, research that the NIH funds with his uh, guidance or implementation of what was truly the, the first iteration of, uh, that drove the uh, care center network and registry, which was the IPF net, which had sentinel um, uh, studies that drove the field forward and set the stage for where we are now and hopefully um, will allow us to move forward and the, and the focus of his talk uh, the, is the promise of genetics and personalized medicine in pulmonary fibrosis. So I'd like to welcome to him to the stage and uh, thank him in advance for his contributions in the past and in the future. Thank you very much. Well, good morning and, and thank you very much, uh, Greg, for that very kind introduction and thank you to the organizers, Tim, Lisa for the invitation to be here today and to spend some time with you. I'm, I'm blown away also. I'm really uh, thrilled to see such a turnout uh, of committed individuals who care about this disease. I think it's so moving and, and fitting to actually have Mr. Williams uh, tell his story because it's the stories that make a difference. But it's a beautiful way to start today and this meeting with a testimonial and a celebration of life how influential an individual can be on another's life, but also to really understand the, what went on during that person's uh, 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 phase of having a very devastating disease, such as pulmonary fibrosis. I think what it really tells us is that's why we're all here. That's why we take our little role that we can play and really make a difference, because we'd like to turn this into truly a condition that we can treat and cure and not really one where we have to be, be, uh, be mourning those who, who left us too early. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful way to start and, and really is, it is a, a re, a, the reason why we exist. So one of the things that I want to do today is to tell you a little bit about the promise of genetics and personalized medicine in pulmonary fibrosis. Now Tim asked me to uh, focus on this particular area because in a way, um, this is sort of kind of the cutting edge. This is where science is going and uh, where w our role at the National Institutes of Health is try to help facilitate that, how to make that happen a little faster. How do we bring discoveries to therapies to potential cures in a more accelerated way? And, and that's partly why I think uh, this is an exciting area to focus on. So let me see if I can figure out how to work this. Okay. So um, before, before I, so I'm going to give you the bottom line so that, you know, for those of you who don't want to sort of listen to the whole thing, because I'm going to mix some science, I'm going to mix some strategy, and I'm going to mix a little bit of, of how, how we may uh, approach this. But the bottom line is that it's going to take very, very meaningful, deep partnerships and collaborations across the board if we're going to really make a difference in this disease. And, and Greg's introduction couldn't be a better segue for what I'm going to tell you now, because I'm going to give you some examples of how at the National Institutes of Health we can help you, we can help the cause, we can advance the science, but we can't do it alone. We're one uh, piece of a big equation that involves a wide group of stakeholders. And if we all take some ownership and take a, a role in, in whatever capacity you can to help move it forward, then I think you're going to see progress and progress happening faster than maybe it's happened to date. So that's the takeaway. It is this partnership, the collaboration, the interaction with the community, and by that I mean the scientists, clinicians, patients, industry, I can go on and on. But it is really this very meaningful partnership that makes it work, that makes it happen. And I think that's really where all of you have a very significant role to play in, uh, in, in this whole enterprise. Now let's see. Okay, so um, this morning I want to hit on four 
particular topics that, that hopefully I can uh, give you sort of a flyover so it won't be too deep. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about the National Institutes of Health, uh, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute's strategic vision around personalized medicine. I want to tell you a little bit about existing models for precision medicine in lung research. And you're going to ask yourself, well, why are you telling me about these other areas? It has nothing to do with fibrosis. Well, it does. It's a model. It's a, it's a way to approach it. And I want to show you, using some of those models, how pulmonary fibrosis can benefit from that. I want to tell you a little bit about the resources that exist uh, for PF, and it really does um, uh, leverage off of what Greg mentioned earlier about the foundation's role in the registry and how massive an undertaking that is to round up uh, all of those individuals so that we can harness the, the, the power of numbers and, and, and extract as much information about the disease as we can from as many people as we can. And then tell you a little bit about uh, how you might approach this uh, for pulmonary fibrosis. So let me just um, uh, move into our strategic vision. And this is really not meant to be a deep dive into our uh, approach to um, how we look at science across uh, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. But over the past a couple of years, um, we have launched uh, a very ambitious plan using a lot of very creative, innovative platforms, crowdsourcing platforms, to co collect as much information from all of those individuals uh, who, who care about the NHLBI's mission to give us their views and input on where we should go, where should we direct some of those resources, because those resources are you, your resources. They're your taxpayer dollars at work. So we want to make sure we're putting them to the best, most optimal use. So at the, at the end of this very extensive effort, we came up with four goals that spanned uh, very normal biology all the way to implementation, outreach, training of investigators, and they all kind of hover around um, eight particular objectives, and within each objective you can drill down and you can find specific uh, critical uh, challenges and compelling questions that the community has told us we should try to answer over the next decade or so. And so this is a long-term plan uh, with some short-term uh, objectives and long-term goals, and, 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 and we hope that with this roadmap, so to speak, we're able to really kind of uh, address the wide scope of science uh, from, from very basic all the way to clinical and, uh, uh, that the Institute's mission covers. And, and I think it's been very, very helpful. Now, I'm not going to go into this in any more detail than that, other than to tell you that if you really want to look closely as, to, as to where pulmonary fibrosis fits into this, I'd urge you to go to our website and look at this document. It's not that uh, hard to, 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 uh, to read through. And what it will do is it will give you a sense of what specific questions all of you said we should try to address. And there are several in there that touch on pulmonary fibrosis. So I think you're there. In, and you're, you're visible, you're, and, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's clearly an important priority for the NHLBI and certainly the lung program within the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Now, when you look at this big uh, collection of, of, and scope of questions and areas that we could pursue, because the lung division of NHLBI is very broad, from very common diseases like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and asthma, all the way to rare lung diseases that are even more rare than pulmonary fibrosis. And maybe we're seeing now it's not as rare as we thought. But we have tried to put our hands around that big strategic vision and understand uh, and try to, try to break it down so that into sort of five key areas that the division is going to pursue over the next five to 10 years that will hopefully fill in gaps in knowledge that we are missing right now to really better understand a disease or, again, move towards uh, prevention, both primary, secondary, as well as try to look for new therapies and ways to, to, uh, to cure the disease. And I'm not going to, again, uh, talk about all of these. You can see going from prevention, disparities, precision medicine implementation, and regeneration. Those are the key areas, themes, topics, uh, overriding areas that the division is going to pursue and has been pursuing and will continue. Um, in, 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 as we go forward across the range and spectrum of lung diseases. But today, uh, to stay on topic, I'm going to focus on precision treatments because that's the area that, again, I feel and we at the division feel hold a lot of promise for not only pulmonary fibrosis but for other areas. So what do we mean when we talk about precision care for patients? What's that all about? That term and that, that um, 
phrase is tossed around a lot. And when, you know, I think this cartoon sort of summarizes it where it puts the patient in the center. And on either end, we have things like the environment and exposures and, and the like. And on the other end, we have the genes and the cells and the molecules. And what we really need to do is bring those two entities together into developing up a comprehensive molecular, cellular, and omics, for lack of a better way, to capture all of the different types of approaches that are being there to interrogate the genome and then to co collapse that into a clinical database that will help inform both therapeutics as well as understanding pathobiology. Because it's really critical that we understand the mechanism underlining the disease, when, especially when you have a heterogeneous disease like pulmonary fibrosis and other lung diseases, that we really drill down on that pathway. Because in order to get the right medicine to the right patient at the right time, which is precision medicine, we absolutely need to harness this knowledge to be able to do it in a meaningful way with our eyes open and with a way that we know will likely produce positive outcomes. It's also associated with how do we collect biomarkers and other things that we can, can, that we can measure in the blood or the sputum or the urine or somewhere in some bodily fluid that's really easily accessible to be able to mark whether that therapy is having a benefit or whether or not that uh, is not really working the way we think. And we want to integrate all that uh, to understand the mechanism as well as then the best way to target therapy. And this will allow us not only for early determination of a therapeutic response, but it will also eliminate things like side effects that we know occur. It will allow us to think about preventative strategies, and it, would, it should indeed improve overall quality of life and, and hopefully longevity. So when we talk about precision medicine, this is, a, this is what it all boils down to and what it collapses into. So what knowledge do we need then if we're going to approach uh, this whole concept of precise care? How do we do that? Well, what we really need to think about is the building blocks around putting this whole puzzle together. And we want to deliver tailored interventions to the right patient in the, in the right population. So it, it covers a research com, uh, continuum that goes, when, when you have a disease like pulmonary fibrosis that's very heterogeneous, and pre presents itself uh, with very different types of biology that's going on, but yet when we treat the disease, it's one size fits all. And we know when we do that, some will respond and some won't. And why? Well, there shouldn't be any real mystery behind that. The biology is different in each and every one of us. So we want to identify specific populations, develop interventions that target disease pathways, and develop biomarkers that will uh, monitor the responsiveness of the individuals. So this is a kind of a holistic approach tailored to the individual needs. Every one uh, patient is going to have a different profile. So it's the clinical molecular heterogeneity that we need to develop. That's the characteristics of the patient and going very deep into understanding that. Develop the that pathway in the biology that will allow us to then target specific therapeutic options and then hopefully find that efficacious therapy in that population. And this is where our partners in industry really play a critical role. But then importantly, and, and, and critically oftentimes is left off, how do we translate that into practice and quickly? Because that's where, we, where the rubber hits the road. That's where all of us need to benefit from the research that we're supporting. And we need to do that in a more rapid way. Now I'm going to just, I just uh, um, uh, displayed a few examples of how the Institute has helped facilitate that process in a couple of ways in different disease areas. So I'm, not, again, not going to touch on uh, all of the examples that are here, but by filling it in a little bit, it gives you a sense that through programs that we have established to do deep phenotyping in patients with pulmonary hypertension or asthma, for instance, and to develop up uh, programs that, that look for um, advanced diagnostics and experimental therapeutics to move towards IND enabling, so get drugs to uh, the FDA for approval sooner. That's a program that has been put in, has, was put in place several years ago in the lung area to help facilitate that work. And then setting up clinical networks that were able to test in populations some of those novel discoveries. And then as I'll show you in, in our example, in our asthma example, how we've then taken it into the community and really have now said, this is where all the action occurs. Does it work? And can, is it sustainable? 
And that, I think, is where um, uh, I think a, a lot of the outcome of what all that upstream work uh, re re results in. So let me take you through a few examples very quickly of how we went, ahead, went about doing this in, um, in, in a couple of diseases. And then, again, kind of bring it back to pulmonary fibrosis as to why this model or this algorithm or this way, one way of doing it might work for all of you. And I put this here just as a way to say that every lung disease uh, has a varying degree of knowledge right now. And so it's not really that straightforward to say that, okay, everybody is at the same starting point and we can just go ahead and begin uh, this process and we'll have um, the, um, the kinds of results that, that um, you, you want very quickly because there, the advances in knowledge and science has occurred a little differently across the various lung disease areas. And this is just showing you that, and, and that's why I'm going to highlight for you asthma and pulmonary hypertension because they have been pushing a little bit uh, ahead of, of others, and then pulmonary fibrosis comes a little bit further behind, but I don't think that's a bad thing in the sense that I think you can catch up relatively quickly. So let me take you through how we got there with asthma, because this is probably one of our poster child projects that I think really tells us that we can do this, and we can really make some significant headway. This is a, a, a d data Again, I'm going back to those, uh, those, those uh, concepts that I mentioned to you at the outset. How do we first of all take the population and identify them and understand their, their, their clinical characteristics all the way down to the molecular level? And so this is how it was done in asthma. In asthma, in severe asthma, um, there was some work going on for many years that actually allowed us to characterize asthmatic patients, uh, whether or not they had a high level of eosinophils, whether they had a high Th2 helper uh, response, whether they were low, and they could cluster those individuals into different phases uh, or, or categories of asthma from very severe to more mild. And what the graph on the left shows you is that even though we had preconceived ideas that people with severe asthma would be way down there on the, at, the, at the right side in the fifth column, you can see that they don't just fall into that category real nice and neat. They actually span. And if you look at the bulk of people with asthma, they kind of span across two or three domains of severity, which is right away telling you that you've got different biology going on. And even though the diagnosis may be the same, and the, the treatments may be similar. The underlying pathobiologies that lead to those clinical symptoms is very different. So if we identify those molecular and cellular phenotypes and endotypes, which is the mechanisms driving it, uh, the disease, we may have a better way to really target therapies. And so the traditional clinical severities don't track with the clinical phenotypes. So that's what this first phase of the asthma program told us and taught us, but it gave us a, a real window into whether or not we could actually target molecular pathways to really understand this better. And so that science led to the pathobiological research that, that moved us towards the molecular targets. And this was a really very breakthrough exciting science where it showed that RNA expression in three genes that were shown in airway epithelial cells but then later confirmed in patient populations provided enough information to discriminate responders from non-responders with asthma. And it strongly suggested that the molecular phenotyping data would facilitate a more accurate and personalized treatment for asthma patients. And here you can just see that the, over on the right, left side in the red is those who had a high Th2 asthma phenotype, the one on the left, on the right, were the low, and that you could use three genes, the RNA expression of three genes, to really predict them in, in their response. So you can take that, that from the blood and you can measure that. And that they did is they measured this periostin uh, compound and they could tell based on that who is going to be a responder, non-responder. In fact, uh, that allowed Genentech, the, the uh, uh, industry, to take that uh, information and move it into a clinical trial and that was used for their approval of lepromezumab, which is an IL-13, anti-IL-13 monoclonal antibody that's being used now in some uh, patients with asthma. So you can see how it's moved. Well, we've taken that concept one step further because we now say, okay, we have enough proof of concept that this works. 
But now we need to take this and see if we can personalize it for patients with asthma. So we want to take this, uh, the phenotypes, the endotypes, and we want to do predictive monitoring of biomarkers in multi-stages with an adaptive clinical trial design looking at very precise interventions that may abrogate disease uh, pathobiology and then determine therapeutic response in individual patients. And this is a brand new network that we just set up called Precise. It's looking at precision interventions for severe and exacerbation prone asthma. And I won't take you through the, the complex sort of design of how this network works, but it's very innovative, it's very creative, and it's very cutting edge. And it's not the traditional clinical trials that all of you may have participated in or have had some or understand how they're done because it really moves people through trials based on their, thera their, their, their therapeutic response to the intervention and the monitoring based on a biomarker. So if you respond, you stay. If you don't, you move out of that treatment and you go to the next one. And each one is targeting a different pathway so that we can at the end of the day say, this therapy works for you because of your biology. And that's going to get us really far beyond where we are with a one-size-fits-all concept around uh, how do we um, uh, manage, manage patients with asthma. So let me just touch on pulmonary hypertension quickly because this is another one a little further behind but, but on a very fast track. And many of you know that pulmonary hypertension, there's a number of targeted pathways that are being used to treat pulmonary hypertension. One of them in the middle on this cartoon on the left is endothelin. An endothelial pathway is an important one because there are a number of drugs that target that, and we know a little bit about the biology of the, uh, of the endothelial receptor, but what's really critical is shown in the, path, in the graph on the right, and it shows that individu individuals that have this uh, allele TT uh, attained a uh, much better improvement in uh, their response to an endothelial receptor antagonist than those that had a different genotype or other genotypes. So this is now uh, a genetic, uh, st almost stratified way to look at responders versus non-responders. So the genetic variations in the endothelial receptor determine the patient's response to that antagonist and therefore their response to treatment. So what we need to do now is take this very, again, heterogeneous disease that has very heterogeneous molecular biology even associated with it, but where we understand some of the pathways leading to this disease and figure out how do we integrate the genetics to best produce the outcome uh, that we're looking for in terms of response to, to, to the therapies for this disease. So we set up, again, as we did for asthma, a program called PVDomics. This is Pulmonary Vascular Disease Phenomics Program. It's a very deep phenotyping program to get the characterization of the patient in a, in a much more uh, sophisticated way than the way we're doing it now with the clinical characterization uh, when you come in for a workup in the clinic. And this program spans everything from genome to the physiology. And you can see through this, again, cartoon that this is a program that holds great promise at bringing us more sophisticated molecular understanding of the disease that then hopefully can move us towards a precision therapy for uh, pulmonary, uh, hyper, pulmonary vascular, pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary arterial hypertension. And then I think just to carry this story a little bit further, just last year there was a workshop that the NHLBI held with the community to look at um, this whole idea of what do we need to do to enhance our efforts to bring precision medicine to pulmonary hypertension. And here are just some of the recommendations that came from that workshop about developing, leveraging pulmonary, fibro, uh, pulmonary PV domics to look for more of a precise and effective uh, clinical care, and then coordinate all that through various types of web-based repositories, and, and to think about how then to capture that and, and focus that around uh, looking for meaningful endpoints that are targeted uh, around um, specific interventions that target that biology. So that is a, a, a workshop that was held, recommendations that were made, and the community is starting to now co co uh, co um, coalesce around that concept and thinking about how are they going to now take the next step. Take what we've already provided, the investments that we've made in PV domics and other programs that we support, and bring that now into this kind of a, 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 a way to test it in humans. And I think this is where it's not as far as asthma, but it's working its way towards it. I hope you can kind of get a sense from these examples that this is basically 
a, a model that can be followed. And, and where is pulmonary fibrosis and all that? So then let me spin then, or pivot, if you will, from the other diseases that I've talked about as models or examples of how we've gone about uh, enabling and facilitating uh, research to improve our understanding of precision care for patients with lung disease to now how does that apply to pulmonary fibrosis? It's probably not going to be a real surprise to you that in, in across the spectrum that we have uh, supported research uh, that really has uh, pushed the pulmonary fibrosis frontier. And it's a multi-pronged approach. It uses a lot of different categories. But pulmonary fibrosis has benefited from findings across this spectrum, from very basic science. And Greg um, alluded to some of them related to our networks, our cross-organ program, our, um, our, our cadet program, our, uh, our, our, our pulmonary our, um, program projects that we fund, our clinical trials networks. All of this has elements of it which are all related to pulmonary fibrosis. So you can see that that multi-pronged approach is, is really paying off a bit because it's setting the groundwork for it. And so what has that all led to? Well, in our pulmonary fibrosis network, we uh, conducted several trials that were very, very pivotal, critical trials that actually changed practice. And one might say, well, they were all negative, so what, we didn't learn much. But they, they were absolutely game changers. Uh, we know something about sildenafil in terms of whether that benefits in patients with pulmonary uh, fibrosis. We know something about warfarin in terms of its use. And we know absolutely, uh, without question, that the triple therapy that was being used almost as standard of care was, not, was more harmful than it was beneficial in patients with pulmonary fibrosis. And you don't use it anymore. It's changed practice almost within you know, um, months and years, a short period of time of that trial being published. But interestingly enough, from that trial, we learned that even though the N-acetylcysteine didn't benefit in the triple arm, uh, it did show benefit when you looked at it in and of itself. So I think that brings us to, again, how do we take the concepts and build the blocks that will allow the foundation of the, um, the, 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 the whole area of, of precision medicine for pulmonary fibrosis? And the, the, the observations, I think, that were important uh, coming from those clinical trials that were followed up by the investigators in there is that in the end, the NAC, uh, in arm appears to benefit pulmonary fi uh, fibrosis patients that have a specific uh, um, uh, mutation in a gene, uh, and, and with that mutation, some benefit and some don't. I showed you that for pulmonary hypertension. It absolutely applies here as well. So the NAC differences uh, uh, in terms of efficacious therapy for, fu for pulmonary fibrosis somewhat depend on this TOLIP gene, the TT genotype that was associated with benefit in some, but with the other phenotype, the NACs may have been more harmful. So see, you can separate some of this based on their genetic background, which is really very important. We also know something about telomere length um, in terms of shortening of the telomeres. These are the, the, the lengths of the DNA as you age, but also may be affected uh, with by this disease, and it's higher in patients with pulmonary fibrosis. And probably one of the more exciting and probably breakthrough findings over the last five years has been the role of the uh, mucus uh, 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 layer in the mucus production in pulmonary fibrosis and how the MUC5B promoter polymorphism has a relationship to survival in IPF. So again, the TT and G GT genotypes were associated with improved survival. And so how that MUC5B gene, a gene that involves mucus clearance, which heretofore really wasn't a key uh, element of the pulmonary fibrosis workup, is now very central to both the biology, the genetics, and potentially uh, to future treatments. And why I think the, the future is bright for pulmonary fibrosis is a paper that came out of Naftali Kaminsky's group just recently looking at uh, in whole blood. And they found a 52 gene expression signature that was measured in samples that were, could subcategorize IPF patients into low and high risk groups for mortality and for transplant free survival, demonstrating that this gene signature could be used to predict. Uh, outcome in patients with pulmonary fibrosis. Sound familiar? Does it have a similar ring to it, to the stories I've told you previously in asthma, in, pul pulmonary, fibro in pulmonary hypertension? Absolutely. The community is on it. They're really pr pushing this concept of personalized precision care for patients 
based on their biology, based on the underlying mechanisms, and based on how we can then target therapies. So N NHLBI over the past years has really facilitated development of a number of resources that I believe are really critical to the whole enterprise and the effort behind advancing personalized medicine and pulmonary fibrosis. Greg mentioned the registry. We're working with all of you to help harness and, and build off of that, leverage off of that. We also have a big, huge program called TopMed. In that program, there are 1,500 uh, DNA samples from familial and, I and idiopathic IPF uh, that are being, uh, that, we're, that, that, that whole genome sequencing is being done on those, and then there'll be additional work that will layer on top of that these other omics concepts. So we hope that through that program, we're going to get a better molecular picture of this disease in these patients. We also have the Lung Tissue Research Consortium. This is another biorepository of human tissues, blood has extensive phenotypic data on IPF patients, and this allows researchers to really probe and access that, inf that information and do uh, novel hypothesis testing research. Our, our IPF network provided a wealth of samples uh, to look at for various, uh, uh, again, uh, ancillary type studies that could be done in IPF. And then we set up um, a number of years ago what was called the Lung Genomics Research Consortium, uh, and this has um, a, a, again, a, a good bit of information that's open to, to the community on genetic and cl clinical characteristics of patients with IPF. So these resources are available to mine, to build off of, and to utilize, to push forward. And why I think the future is bright for pulmonary fibrosis is just as we did with pulmonary hypertension a couple years ago, we held a workshop with um, the community, uh, a lot of stakeholders, including patients, to think about where are the future directions that need to be pursued in, it, in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and how can NHLBI help facilitate that. And there were a number of recommendations that came from that. Some of those are already being uh, pursued. Uh, some of those are things that we're kind of pushing because we feel it needs a little bit of a catalyst or a little bit of, a, of, a, of an infusion of, of extra effort. Uh, funds and, and attention, but some of these are things that are going on across the, uh, across the, uh, the research spectrum for, fi for fibrosis right now. So let me wrap it up by just giving you sort of uh, what our take is of where things stand for precision medicine for pu uh, pulmonary uh, fibrosis. First of all, we believe that the Institute has supported a lot of lung disease research programs that provide direction for advancing personalized PF research. I gave you examples in asthma and pulmonary hypertension, but I think you can see how those apply quite nicely to, um, to the uh, area of PF. Also, uh, PF is starting to gather uh, resources and momentum to uh, make pre pre precision care a reality, and I think that's really uh, critically important, but there's a lot of challenges that still exist. And then uh, also, it's a very heterogeneous disease, so the coordination and harmonization of all the data, the omics, the resources, the clinical characteristics is going to be key if we're going to really harness uh, this and really focus it into meaningful outcomes. And then this community, a proactive pulmonary, pulmonary uh, fibrosis community that fosters partnerships and collaborations among the key stakeholders is going to be absolutely critical and necessary for us to bring uh, new therapies forward and ultimately talk about cures for this disease. Thank you so much for your attention today and um, look forward to, to talking with you all later.